you can be dismissed team. That was awesome. I'm so excited about this morning. Um, I'm just excited about everything that's happening. Friday was amazing. You say, how do, how do you know? Well, I was there. I was like a fly on the wall. I was just like in the back. I, I, I see some of you that were there. I, I was there too. It was amazing. What was the most amazing was there was no churchy agenda. It was just churches coming together to worship God, to strengthen women, and to see the kingdom of God grow. Amen. So I mentioned it last Sunday just in passing, but today I'm, I know I had people coming, which church is better? So I'm going to give you the skinny, okay? Do we, do we, is that an old word? Am I, am I showing my age? So quite a while back, I was meeting with somebody at lunch, and they told me, you would probably be a great friend if you weren't so old. <laughs> to which I said, what do you even mean? And the person asked me, well, how old are you? And I said, how old? You know, I hate it when old people are my age. <laughs> it really stinks. Because that person said, how old are you? And I said, my age. And they went. No, they, they weren't being mean. They're a lot younger than me. <laughs> That person might be here. But anyway. <laughs> oh, praise God. But we were talking about prayer and hitting the streets. And we've been talking about this for a while now. And then just a few months ago, before, before I left for New Zealand, I was, it was an, an unfortunate day. And it was a really hard day that somebody that I was mentoring and was really pouring into passed away suddenly from an overdose and it was a really hard day and that day I was sitting with a few brothers and and Spencer Mason was one of them from GLAD and we said we got to do something this like and this is not we got to do something like let's come up with a program and this programs are great and all that's great but we got to break the power of darkness that's over this city and we got to do it in prayer and I said I'm in and so we started talking about that, and next thing, others joined in. So Glad Tiding, Moncton Wesleyan, and our church, and Harvest House, we're, we're all getting together. On September 22nd, mark the date, September 22nd, we're all going to come together. Now you're all welcome to come, all prayer warriors. Now I, I, want, I want to tell you how this is going to look so you don't think, well, I don't know about So not that you're not, but everybody's got a part to play but everybody doesn't have the same part. And some are prayer warriors that just want to go in a prayer closet and shun die. What does that mean? They want to pray in the Holy Ghost. They just want to pray and intercede in their prayer closet. We're making room for that. Some of us just want to go and hit the streets. We're making room for that. So that day is going to look like this. At 5.30, September 22nd, we're going to meet at 108 High Street at the headquarters, the offices for Harvest House. And they're going to open up the building and chapel there for those that want to stay there and pray. I believe Jen's going to, going to open the building and there's going to be prayer. So all those that are prayer warriors that just want to get in there and pray in the Holy Ghost and pray and, and intercede for those going on the streets, there will be a big room there for you. And, all the, and we're going to make our plan there. And then all those that want to hit the streets, boots on the ground. Walk the streets. The Bible says wherever our foot treads, that's where we, that belongs to us. So we're going to start treading. Yeah. Amen. We're going to start walking some streets. And so we're going to go in groups and we're not going to go the city impact group and the glad tiding. No, we're going to get together. We're going to mix it up and we're going to, come on. We want to have unity. And I don't know about you, but this stirs me up. That churches that just want to get together and be the church. Not with their flag or with their shirt that says who they are, but let's just go on the street and let's just take authority over the principalities and powers and rulers of darkness that have been killing our people on the streets, destroying lives. Enough is enough. And, and the church has decided enough is enough. Enough with the division. Enough with the my, my pew, your pew, my building, your building. Enough with that. Let's just be the church. Let's hit the streets and let's win our city. Amen. So September 22nd, 530, 108 High Street, be there or be square. No, okay. 
So just we wanted to make sure that everybody, because not everybody's going to go and hit the streets. So having said all that, I, I, I need to share this morning something that is needed in the body and that is needed if we're going to hit the streets. There's stuff that we got to know, right? And uh, I want to talk about the gifts versus fruit. So there's the gifts of the Spirit. There's the gifts that came from Christ. Amen. And then there's the fruit of the Spirit. And we need to understand those things to properly operate as the church of the living God. You know, the gifts of the Spirit are important. Man, you're quiet. I thought we were Pentecostal here. Usually when you start talking gifts of the Spirit with Pentecostal, they're like, Woo! running around the building. No? <laughs> not, not, none of that today? Okay. I'll run. No. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about those things. And I, wa I want us to see the importance of those things operating in our lives and how we can do the work of God with those gifts operating. They are there to operate. Now, first of all, there's the five-fold ministry. Amen. Which is found in Ephesians. It is, uh, now there are the gifts Christ gave. So these are not the gifts of the Spirit. They're the gifts that when Jesus came and died and rose again, He gave gifts. And this is the gifts that He gave to the church. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, pastors, and teachers. And if you keep reading, it is for the edifying and the building of the body for the work of the ministry. So people think, well, those are ministry gifts and those are the ministers and, and they're the ones that got to do everything. No, 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 no. We're here as a gift to you. My wife and I are a gift to you. Here, here, here we go. It's rude to return gifts. <laughs> like it or not, smile and say thank you. You know when you get a gift at Christmas and you start making faces and that's not what I wanted? That hurts parents' feelings, by the way, kids. So you can't, you can't, you can't choose the gifts that are given to you. When somebody gives you a gift, you just smile and accept it's free. You want to choose it? Then buy it yourself. You can't buy these gifts. <laughs> these are given to the body. Sometimes we, we might not love these gifts because they might come with correction. Jesus corrected. Jesus flipped tables. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants to paint the smiling, loving Jesus. And he was smiling and he was loving, but love also corrects. <laughs> he also flipped tables. Yeah, he also corrected people. I mean, he told, he told one of the apostles, get behind me, Satan. I haven't said that to none of you yet. <laughs> but these are the gifts. And listen, they're a gift and you can't choose what gift you're given. And you can't choose one of those, well, I want to be a pastor. I want to be an evangelist. And I see people, they, they covet one of those. You can't covet those gifts because they're not for everybody. God chooses who he places these gifts on. And that gift will make room for you, not you make room for the gift. If that gift is on you, you don't have to go and announce it and blow a trumpet and say, I'm prophet of the Lord, or I'm this or I'm that. No, that gift will make room for you because it will be evident. You won't have to tell somebody you're a pastor when you're loving on everybody and you're serving everybody and you're cleaning toilets and you're doing whatever it takes to get the job done. That's what a pastor does, by the way. You want to, you want to see the evidence of a pastor? Is they're always giving of themselves. And so when I see people, well, I can preach, I'm a pastor. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> that's not the only evidence. And so these are given to us, and they are given to us so that we can grow. So those are the gifts that Jesus gave. Amen. Now, there are the gifts of the Spirit. And they are found in 1 Corinthians uh, 12. 
starting at verse 7, it says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the Spirit, for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues or languages, to another the interpretation of tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. And so these gifts of the Spirit are distributed to each one as He wills. So He will place these gifts on us. You feel it come upon you. <laughs> you. When I have a word, it's not like I was thinking about this person and I figured something out in my head. No, it just comes upon you. And all of a sudden, you, you can have visions. You can have all kinds of stuff happen. I, I've seen sometimes before a service even starts, I see some of you and I have a word and I, I see it. Before it even happens, it's, it comes upon you. It's not something you can conjure up or that you can make happen. Oh, well, God, I want to have a word of wisdom right now for somebody. It comes upon you, and it's used as needed. So, again, if you don't ever put yourself out there, don't wonder why the gifts are not operating in your life. Because they're not made to operate sitting at home watching TV. They're made to operate as you go out and you minister to people, as you put yourself in front of people, as you start to go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news. And then those gifts can start operating. And they're, they're not just for in the church. It, I, look, I've had enough of showmanship with the gifts. You can get quiet, I don't care where it's only used in the church to attract the church, to show like how spiritual they are because they can prophesy. Look, that's all great that you can prophesy. What about prophesying at Tim Hortons on that person that doesn't know Jesus? What about operating the gifts outside the walls of this church? What about signs and wonders and miracles happening out there? What about you laying hands on the sick at the hospital? What about you operating in the gifts outside of the church where it's comfortable and they're singing the hymn and you're feeling just right? Because the gifts operated more outside of the synagogue than in the synagogue. Amen. And so if you're coveting these gifts, then you should be coveting going out there and praying for people and seeing things happen out there and, and your neighbors and at your workplace. And those gifts should operate everywhere that you're going because those gifts are needed for the world. And I'll give you an example. I, I had this man of God and he was sharing how he was at a, at a conference and it wasn't a Christian conference. He was a businessman. Norval Hayes. Some of you might know the name if you're old like me. You young people never heard of him. He's not even alive anymore. But <laughs> Brother Norval Hayes said, I'm, I'm at, a, at a conference for businessmen. And he, he was a great businessman. And he said, I'm trying to win this businessman to Jesus. He's sitting at my table. Then we go out for lunch. I'm sitting with him at lunch. And I, I'm telling you, I am pushing every button and pulling every lever and, and bringing every sad story I know and and. Everything I got, I'm trying to get this guy to accept Jesus. And he's just like, nope, not interested whatsoever in your God. And he goes, I get, we get back, and, and, and now he's sitting at another table. Because <laughs> he's had enough of my religion. <laughs> and he goes, I sit down at my table, and the Holy Ghost said, you need to go to him and tell him his wife and his son are going to hell, and it's his fault. Because at the table while they were talking at the restaurant, he started saying, if God is real, then why do I have an alcoholic wife and a drug addict son and I go home every day and I dread going home? If there's a God, why? He said, oh. <laughs> He said, I went there and I told him. And he said, he broke and accepted Jesus there as his Savior. He said, and then he went on home and he was an atheist. He went on home and told his wife he accepted Jesus because she saw the smile on his face. And she accepted Jesus and got set free from alcoholism. And their son came home and mom and dad that never talk because they were always angry are sitting there with a smile on their face. And the son says, what's going on? And he said, we accepted Jesus. And the son accepted Jesus and got set free from drugs. Come on. All of that happened because one gift operated through a man. 
And what he tried, everything he knew to do didn't work. That one gift did in seconds. I always liken it to this, like, like building a house with hand tools. It can be done with a hammer and a handsaw. Come on. It can be done. It's going to take quite a while. But if you got power tools. I, I used to work roofing when I was out west. We did cedar shakes. And uh, our team, our crew, was kind of the misfits, and <laughs> they didn't give us nothing. So it was like, fend for yourself. So we had our hatchet and our pouch and our nails, and away we went, and we did roofing. The other team, they had the, the power ladder, so they didn't have to carry the bundles up top. They had power tools, like they had air nailers and all that. They could do three roofs to our one roof with power tools. Why would you not want to operate in the gifts of the Spirit? It'll lead more people to Jesus. That man would have left there unsaved if that gift didn't start operating. And he yielded to that gift and spoke what the gift said. And the gift operated through him and everything changed. And so the gifts are very important. It's important that we, the Bible says, covet the gifts. Like, you know, look for the gifts. Pray in the Holy Ghost and ask for the gifts to operate in your life. You know, I, I ask all the time, Lord, I want, to, I want to walk in the prophetic. I want to walk under the anointing and the mantle of the Holy Ghost. I want to see people's lives change because I had a word for them. It's exciting when you have a word for somebody and their life is transformed and changed because of it. It's amazing. It's amazing when you lay your hands on the sick and they recover. And miracles happen. Praise God. And God puts that anointing on you. I'm telling you, like, he can put an anointing on you, and all of a sudden it's not even you, and you, it's not even your faith. It's just like it comes upon you. It's the gift of faith. And then, you, you know, I remember one time, God, it came on me, and I could feel it coming on me, and, and I heard the Holy Spirit say, choose your words right now. Because the gift of faith is upon you, and what you speak, you will have. Don't speak the problem. Speak the answer. I was going through stuff. When we sang that song today, my wife kind of felt led to get them to sing that song. That song just messes me up every time. Because all I can see is looking at the sun and then trying to look at something else after. And all you can see is the sun. And all of a sudden, what's right in front of you, you can't see because you're still blinded by the glory of the sun. So when we turn to Jesus in every situation and circumstance, and all of a sudden we get in that glory of God, and we get in that presence of God, and we get in that anointing of the Holy Ghost, and all of a sudden we turn back to that problem, and that problem through the eyes of having just seen Jesus seems so small, kind of even seem blurry and insignificant. Amen. And so those gifts are so important. So the gifts of the Spirit is something that comes upon us and that we are used in this. Amen. But then there's the fruit of the Spirit. You say, what's the difference between the gifts and the fruit? Well, Galatians 5, and 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit, same Spirit, one's a gift, this is fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So the gifts, the, you ready? If you're taking note, this is the time. The gifts are given, but fruit is cultivated. If I give you a gift, you don't have to do anything for it. Just say thank you, I hope. But if I say you need to bear fruit, then you've got a part to play in this. You might have to dig the ground. You might have to fertilize it. Plant some seed. Then weed it. Make sure the weeds don't get in there. So bringing forth fruit has work and labor to it. Receiving a gift is free. So the gift of the Spirit you just sit there and receive these gifts and they operate through you. But bearing the fruit of the Spirit means you have to part, a part to play. You need to choose to walk in love. You need to choose to walk in forgiveness. 
just putting it out there, but unforgiveness is not a fruit of the Spirit. If that's the fruit you're bearing, it's not a fruit of the Spirit of God. Amen. Don't get mad at me. I'm just letting you know it is rotten fruit. Nobody wants to eat that. Right? But the fruit of the Spirit. And so it's important that we understand it's more important to bear fruit than to operate in the gifts. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm going to show you. All right. So we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 13. It says this. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels. So speaking in tongues, speaking in languages. So it's a gift, right? Of the Spirit. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, which is what? A fruit of the Spirit. I am a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, or I prophesy, which is a gift of the Spirit, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, amen, and I have all faith, so the gift of faith, as to remove mountains, but have not love, which is a fruit, I am nothing. <clears throat> if I give all that I have, and I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. And this is what was stirring in my spirit this morning. And God said this. Love is the fruit of the Spirit. All the other things that fall under that, if you go in 1 Corinthians 13, they are all part of love. In, in the Hebrew language, they have what they call root words, and then there are words that are der derivatives. Uh, English major right here. <laughs> derivatives of that word. So I remember Chip Brim used to say it's almost like, like a wagon wheel where you have the hub in the middle, and then you have all the spokes that come out of that hub, and what makes the wheel go around. So if you start taking some of those spokes out, that's not going to run smooth. So love, if you start to take away forgiveness, or you start to take away long-suffering, or patience, or kindness, it's not going to run smooth. Because, you know, the same as if I sin one sin, I've broken all the commandments. If you take away one spoke, it's not love anymore. Right? And so God tells us this. He says... Okay, I got, I got to go back to 1 Corinthians. You've got to see this because this is how he showed it to me. He said, if you replace the word love with fruit, okay, because love is the fruit, okay, and you read it like this, if I speak in tongues of men and of angels but have not fruit, I'm a noisy or clanging cymbal. Or let, let's, let's go farther. Let's replace... Uh, Tongues with gifts. Although I have gifts, but I have no fruit. Come on. I can operate all gifts, but if I have no fruit. God says, I'm just a noisy clanging cymbal. Because God never asked us. Oh, here it is. You ready? He never said, go forth and, bear, and be giftful. Go forth and be fruitful. Right from the beginning, right from the garden, he told Adam and Eve, go and be fruitful. God desires fruit more than gifts. Because gifts, he's the one that gave them, but fruit is what you cultivated with what he gave you. And it's a choice. You know, we used to listen to DC Talk back in the day. Love is a verb. Love has actions. You choose your actions. You choose to walk in love. Love is a choice. It's not a tingly feeling like Hollywood would tell you. It's not goosebumps and butterflies. Love is a choice. Listen, I've been married for 26 years. I choose to love my wife. 
She chooses to love me every day. Love, love prefers others. Amen. You catch yourself thinking about you more than others. You might be getting into the realm of selfishness. Right? And so love chooses others. It's a choice. I choose to walk in love. I choose to forgive. Amen. I choose to honor others above myself. I choose to be happy when something good happens to somebody else, even though nothing good has happened to me today. I'll give you an example. Back in the day, I was believing God for a car. I had an old beat-up car. It was one of those, you know, you drive through a water puddle and the puddle's gone, but you're wet. That, that type of car. <clears throat> I was believing for a car. <clears throat> I mean, I was just new in the Lord. And uh, somebody else got a brand new vehicle. And I was like, they already had a vehicle. God, what? Jealousy. Jealousy is ugly. And it was rising up. And I had God say to me, you know, they're expecting another child and they needed a van. That's why I gave them a van. And second of all, if you can't be happy for them, then how can I bless you? He goes, you need to check your attitude and check your love walk. And so I said, okay, God, I'm excited for them. I'm happy for them. I'm going to congratulate them. And I'm next in line. Because you're in the giving car mood. <laughs> right? You need to choose love. I got, I got one more. You need to choose joy. It's part of love. It's part of fruit of fear. Yeah, but you just don't know what happened to me today. You don't know what happened to me this week. You don't, you don't know where my, like, my finances, my this, my that. Mm, it's a choice. Brother Hagen used to say, make yourself laugh. Ha ha. Ha ha ha. Ha ha ha. Woo! <laughs> Get happy. It's a choice. I'm trying to close, but I can't and I won't. So, so one day, my wife and I, we were getting ready to go. I forget where we were going. We were going on a road trip. And we had, we ha might have been church, yeah, if that was that day. I know this is another day, I think. No, we were going on a drive, I remember. We were going for the day. And, and, and I remember we got into what I call intense fellowship. <laughs> in the house before getting in the car. And I got in the car. And I'm mad. And I'm sitting at the car mad. And I'm telling you, I am waiting for her to come. <laughs> so she can see how mad I am. And just like that, I had the Holy Spirit say to me, you can choose what today's going to look like. And you can choose now. And you can take that ugly face off and put the pretty one on. <laughs> Put a smile on your face. When she comes in, greet her with a happy greeting. You know what? I did that, and we started driving. I couldn't even remember what we fought about. We had a great day. We might have been our fall ride. I forget, but we, we were going driving somewhere. We were, it, it, we were going to be together for a while, and that choice was wise, I'm telling you, because that would have been a long, quiet drive. But you need to choose joy. I, I had to choose joy right then and there. And when you do, then the Holy Spirit steps in. Because remember, it's still the fruit of the Spirit. So even though you make the choice, the Holy Spirit gets involved. He gets in there. He helps you with that choice you just made. He empowers you to walk in that choice you just made. He will begin to bring a joy that 
just explodes inside of you because you made the choice to choose joy. He'll begin to a peace that passes all understanding because you chose peace in the midst of the storm. Listen to me. When Jesus was in that boat, all of them were panicking because there was this big storm brewing, but Jesus spoke peace in the midst of the storm. He chose peace, and when he chose peace, the whole storm had to obey the peace instead of the peace obeying the storm. Stop allowing situations and circumstances to cause your joy to obey it instead of your joy causing that situation and circumstance to obey you. Amen. Choose joy. Choose peace. I got one more, and then I'm I'm honest, I'll let you go. So I had this thing called impatience. (laughs) Oh, it was bad. And God started dealing with me. Like, I mean, I I know it was really bad. Like, you know, and things started happening. And we, we were, (laughs) we were at a conference at Rod Parsley's church. And my mom is here. She probably remembers this. And to go to Rod Parsley's church, you're in Columbus, Ohio. It's a big city, but the church is out in a cornfield. And to get to that cornfield, there's one road. And when you come off the highway, to get on that road, as soon as you come off the highway, you have to merge into that lane or you're going to the mall. And I knew all the cars going there, they're all Christians because this road leads to the church. They wouldn't let me in. So I drove to the mall parking lot. And I'm getting mad. Come around the mall parking lot, go back up the highway. Go back there again, go in the merge lane, got my signal on. Nobody's letting me in. And now I'm getting more mad because I'm impatient. And God's trying to teach me patience. And my mom goes, how many times are you going to go around that mountain of that mall parking lot before you just put a smile on your face and stop being so impatient? Oh, I wasn't listening to her. I was mad. Now Now I'm mad. Now I'm mad. I ain't listening to that, that holy stuff. Get away from me. So anyway, after so many times, somebody finally let me in. That's fine. We go to the church. We hadn't had supper. So coming back, we said, we're going to go to the grocery store. And I could see it. I was, I was going to, I had a plan. I was, I was going to have potato salad and some nice meat and go get some bread and mustard and make sandwiches and have potato salad and sandwiches at at the hotel room. I get there, and I'm in line, and I can see the potato salad, right? It's right there. And there's like two, three people in front of me, and they get their stuff, blah, 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 and it gets to me, and the lady grabs the potato salad, rips it out, and puts clothes on top of the counter. (laughs) Oh, she took my potato salad (laughs) and closed the deli. Like, there was nobody else behind me. Like, no, no, it's closing time. She's closing. Oh, I stomped my feet like a child all the way over to where they sell that, that nasty meat that's already packaged, you know, that Oscar Mayer stuff or whatever. Grab that, grab the bottle of mustard and a loaf of bread. Now I'm stomping my feet. And the Holy Spirit again goes, Do you know how funny this looks from up here? You look like a six-year-old that's having a tantrum. And I was like, finally it dawned on me. Okay. All right, God. I'm giving this to you. From now on, I'm going to be patient. So I started going in lineups and not, you know, you know, not even looking at, oh, that line shorter than going there. And then, and then they have that cashier calls, credit check or price check. You know, that happens all the time when you get impatient. You're going that. I stopped doing that. And I start seeing how impatient people are. And I start going, that was me. So that's what I portrayed to others as trying to portray a child of God that has peace and joy and Jesus is great and my life is great and I'm stomping my feet down aisle number five because I didn't get my own way. It's a choice. So I start to have this choice called patience. Because it's part of the fruit of the Spirit, and it's part of love. And I started going, 
I'm going to sing hymns. I'm, 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 I'm going to smile. I'm going to be happy in that line. No matter how long that line is, no matter if that person has three price checks, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to choose to be patient. And that thing broke off of me. It did. Sometimes it tries to creep back up, and I choose to cast it down and say, no, I'm not, going, I'm not being that person again. I'm not being that six-year-old stomping. Not, that's not happening again. You have to choose love. And that's how you cultivate the fruit of the Spirit. You choose to cast down those things. You choose to have patience. You choose to have joy. You choose to have peace. In the midst of a storm, you choose to have peace. In the midst of all that life is thrown at you, you choose to have patience. You choose to bear fruit even when all around you, the situations are saying you're not going to bear that fruit. You're going to bear the other fruit. And you make that choice. No, I am going to bear the fruit of the Spirit no matter what life looks like, no matter what's thrown at me, no matter what the enemy's doing, no matter what's happening around me, I'm going to walk this out. And I'm going to bear fruit. And I'm not going to stop bearing fruit because God said be fruitful. More than he said be giftful. Amen. And that's why he said you, you can operate all the gifts, but if you have no fruit, Are you really useful? Because people want fruit. They want to partake of the fruits that's hanging off of your life. Amen?